Hello, everyone, and welcome to Edge of Things. My name is Serena, and joining us today is Akeem Krause, an Eclipse Foundation contributor and committer who will be presenting his topic on mobile beehive scale. If you have any questions for Akeem as we move through today's presentation, feel free to ask it in the chat or use the Ask a Questions tab. Without any further delay, Akeem, over to you. Yeah, so welcome. Let me present the slides. So I hope you see something. Yeah, looks good. So welcome to the mobile beehive scale session. It's about cellular IoT with co-op and DTLS in the wild. So it's not a theoretical project. It's a real project in the wild. Um, so my name is Achim Kraus, and this is a follow-up session of last year's session about DTLS, SID meets Seafire. So therefore, Mainly the numbers are just plus one year. So I have 25 years experience in software development and testing plus one, 15 plus one exper years experience with distributed systems, seven plus one years experience now with IoT, co-op, DTLS and lightweight M2M. I'm a committer in Eclipse Californium and I'm the project lead of Eclipse Californium and I'm a committer in Eclipse Tiny DTLS and I'm also IETF co-author of the RFC 9146. That's the DTLS 1.2 uh, connection ID stuff. So what will we have? We have a short technical overview of the system and then I will show you some deployments in the wild. So that's the mobile beehive scale, the battery vampire and the wine refrigerator shepherd it's all a maker project so it's not a real product you can buy it's just a maker project where you can see how this technique works so theoretically or the, the, the specification basis of all this is co-op dtls 1.2 connection id i will now skip the 1.2 because that's too complicated and call it dtls sit so co-op is RFC 7252. For those who don't know it, it's like HTTP, REST over UDP. It's pretty efficient and reliable, even if any protocol claims to be efficient and reliable, but <laughs> this is also the, that. Um, it's, it's a great match for radio message based systems communication. So um, yeah, then we have DTLS. 1.2 this is and connection id this is based on two rfc's rfc 6347 that's the dtls 1.2 and, and connection id that's rfc 9146 this is tls like encryption over udp so it's very like U tls because it is really derived from tls and this connection id stuff this is uh, adds support for longer quiet phases and this helps to to really uh, use the power saving function which are have been added in the past years to some um, radio messaging based communications like power sleeping mode or release assistant indication that are terms from cellular technology together both specifications are IETF standards, and that's a way to communicate efficient and reliable and secure over radio messages. Uh, of course, it works also if you're on wires, but uh, on radio, the point is that other protocols do not really do that well, so this works well on radio messages as well. So just an overview of the buildings. So it's... Uh, we have modems and sensors, and then we need a cell tower. So a mobile network operator is required. Then we have the co-op S3 proxy, which receives the co-op messages and forwards them to the S3, to the simple storage service, which is also here on the picture. And from the simple storage service on, then we can use HTTP to view the data in a web browser. So currently, 
Um, the modems are all based on the Nordic NRF 9160. Other modems would be possible, but for now I didn't uh, add the support for them to the to the software. Um, it uses as operation system Zephyr, and you need to use the Nordic Connect SDK. It's all open source, and you can get it. Um, it comes with a, with a collection of sensors, so this this is growing. It's not at the moment. It's not that big as other collections, but it's really growing and it's not too small. So I found close to everything I need. So when we, we see here then some pictures, that's a Thinky 9.1. This is a out of the box device from Nordic itself. This is the NRF 9160 Feather. It's from Jared Wolf. So that's the maker to tool. So if you want to add some sensors or do your own customized project, the Feather is currently uh, yeah, the thing of things, so mass aller Dinge. <laughs> and here you have a power meter chip. It's a ENA290 supported by Zephyr. And here you have the environment sensor. It's a B BME280 also supported by Zephyr sensors. So it's it's usually pretty easy to, to add your own sensors to, uh, to a feather and have a working system. Easy doesn't mean half an hour, it means maybe two or three afternoons or something like that, but it's possible. So uh, here we see something more about the software architecture. So we have at the basics, we have Zephyr. Zephyr comes then with GPIO, E2C, SPI and UART support. And in our system, we have then a TCP and UDP support via the modem on our module. We mainly use the UDP stuff. And on the top of this, we, de we can then handle the sensors, mainly with SPI and E2C. And here, over UDP, we communicate with DTLS connection ID. That's the tiny DTLS implementation. On the top of this, we use the simple co-op client from Zephyr. And binding everything together, we can then build applications which are using then co-op for communications and sensors to uh, yeah, get, get the things out of the, the real world. So everything together is really customizable. It's highly efficient. It's reliable. It's secure and it's an open source demo. So you, you don't need to pay, at least not me, you need to pay for the hardware, but not for the software. And what you get, is then something like if you use a Thinky 9.1, you can send half a year, every hour a message from the internal battery, which is a not too large one. So that's a, a really high efficient thing. And, and it really works for half a year. It's not something like that it stops after two weeks, at least in the main average. So there will be cases when it is not that, but I think quite a lot will make pretty good experience with this client. So on the other side, on the cloud side, we then need either Cloud VM or our own computer center. Um, it starts with two cores and two gigabyte of RAM. Usually the footprint of Linux and Java is not that small. So using smaller machines doesn't make too much sense. Um, for some benchmarks, I'm used to use four cores and 60 gigabyte of RAM. And with such a machine, you can handle 1 million concurrent devices with about 50,000 messages per second. Uh, but the point is you have usually a backend and this backend is usually limiting these numbers again. So you don't get the 50,000 messages per second, usually for the most backends I know. Uh, for the operation system on the server side, we use Linux. It's also possible to use Windows. On Linux, we have a better support for get statistics over the UDP layer, means how many UDP messages are already dropped before the application receives it and so on. And that's only done for Linux. Uh, the software running on Linux is mainly the Java engine. And we have a software, the, the Eclipse Californium stack. This is co-op and DTLS 1.c SIT. It's also open source. That's the long-term project I'm running. I think it's now longer than 10 years at the Eclipse space. And I run this now for, or I am a committer about this about for eight years or something like that. It's cool. Yeah, over the years we, we fixed a lot of bugs. So for now it's really reliable, it's efficient and it's end-to-end -end encrypted device communication. That's something which just really works. 
some other projects as Lesion, Honu, and Apache Camel, Thingsport. They are also using Californium as their co-op player. So it's pretty easy to you have a Java API for receiving and sending co-op messages. So it looks then like this. So on the sensor, you on the on the device, you, you you read the values from the sensors, like here the temperature, humidity, and air pressure. I put also some statistics here in, like this device is 129 days online. It has sent 3,000 messages. It needs some retransmissions and more retransmissions, and it sends these messages then with co-op and encrypted with DTLS. And on the other side, the co-op messages runs into the, the, the co-op cloud server. And yeah, you then have just the Java callback. Here is the handle post. You get the exchange in, and then you can call get request payload. And at that point, you exactly have the, the things you send it to the server. That's quite easy in a direct way. So. Sometimes you don't want to implement something like this handle post um, and you want to have a more generic solution. And so one of the ideas here is a, a custom application which then puts all these co-op requests into an S3 service. So I call this the co-op S3 proxy. So this is really a, a cool bridge for having specific device communication into common cloud computing. Um, S3, it's simple storage service. It's really very common. It's av available on very different clouds. So it's on RBS, Azure, Exascale, DigitalOcean. I think Stackit also has it. So this is really common. Um, it, it, it's used pretty straightforward and simple. So the, the device just sends data. And if that gets received, then it's stored in S3. And if the device wants to read its configuration, then it reads the configuration from S3 and puts it back in the co-op uh, response. We also use this for FOTA, means we do uh, store the, the device image on S3. And if the device then requests it, then we read the, the image from S3 and convert this in co-op requests. So that's that's really what, what this uh, proxy all does. It just converts between co-op and between S3, and that's it. So um, it's currently in, in a pull request. So I hope I get it merged until end of this month. That's, that's the, the, the reason, uh, or that's the target. So uh, if we do this, so what I said earlier about the numbers, um, S3 reduces, unfortunately, the maximum number of messages per second. This depends a lot on which S3 provider you're using. The smaller ones, they will get you about 300 or a little more write requests. It's about write reading. The most are much faster, so reading is about 1,000 or 1,500. Uh, but the bigger ones, like RVS, they offer you uh, 3,000 messages per second and more. That's, uh, yeah, compared to the 50,000 messages for Californium, it's not that much, but uh, here you get then the bridge into the common cloud technology. It's also not really hard because um, what, what we usually do is we send the messages not too high frequently. So if we have 1 million devices and we send one message per hour, that results in less than 300 messages per second. And so you see, that even with with a S3 implementation, which isn't that fast, it still has a lot of reserves. Okay, if we do FOTA, then it's something like that we need a, quite a lot of multi co-op requests. It's blockwise, so it's transferred in single blocks. Basically, this means if you have something like 400 kilobyte of firmware, that's currently our size, then it's about 400 requests. But this is only one S3 request, so we read the whole firmware at one, and then only the proxy splits it up into single parts. Um, in my experience, the permission system of S3 is sometimes limited. It's it's more intended for backend systems to communicate with and not for real end users. So what we do as workaround 
is then we try to put our data in multiple buckets in order to have then uh, different domains. Um, so we, we offer also installation scripts uh, for, for Exascale, RWS, and DigitalOcean, and it's also pretty easy to do a manual setup. Uh, last part of the system, it's a web browser. So that's the, the really easy part one, because this runs then on smartphones, tablets, and PCs on close to every operation system, Linux, Windows, iOS, Android. Yeah, it's, it's simply a piece of software, JavaScript, executed in a web browser. Uh, what it does, it tries to to get it, it works via uh, usually uh, via login service which converts your login credentials into s3 credentials so s3 credentials are uh, rp keys you can imagine them as say 20 random characters and that's not really helpful and therefore we have a login then you can have your username and your user password and then you get back your s3 credentials uh, you can possibly co-locate this at a co-op s3 proxy and it, once you have this s3 credentials then the web application so this javascript in your browser directly accesses the data on the S3 via HTTP request. It fetches and writes to the S3 service and it doesn't longer use the proxy for that. So it's also, uh, the, 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 the app is able to, to generate simple charts and based on the device data and to show the data, well, the last received one and the configuration data. So that's an example. Here we see a chart, and here we see the last received data. The chart is then pretty easy. Red is the temperature, blue is the battery, and the green lines are the weights of the scales. Here we see also some information about the device, the, the firmware number, and here we have something about the network and so on. And here we have uh, the weights, and here we have a temperature. So it's a very simple text-based messaging system for now. Uh, for the most demo cases, this is a, a pretty straightforward way to, to collect data from the sensors on the device and to show them and visualize them then in a web browser. So as I already said, the permission system of S3 is really a basic one. So you can you can reduce the access for those who have no keys. They don't see it, so it's private. But once you have a key, then you either can read it or you can, if you have another key, you can also write it. But it's not a fine-grained role-based grants, at least not in all S3 implementations. And so therefore, what we do is that we usually try to have one key pair for read and one for write and then we assign this to users and admins and then we split all the user groups into separate domains that's what currently get for a demo system what we want uh, it's also the intention of the system is not to uh, is to provide a good udp experience with low initial invest it's not intended to have an out of the box end user system so the point which I recognize is that if the people need two weeks in order to get the initial system running with co-op and DTLS, then mm, that's that's too much. So the intention of this project is to, to, to lower this initial invest. So I feel that it should be done on the device with one afternoon and then the solver also with one afternoon and then it depends on how much you want to customize it if it takes longer but that's what i think should work uh, and if you think this ui this web ui is too simple i agree with that but if you want to have more sophisticated uis or if you want to have other backends say a Kafka or something like that, then this is out of the scope of this small project and this requires uh, development in your side. So hope I haven't lost too many. So we're now on on the on the mobile beehive scale on the wild. So let me explain a little 
before why we do this. So here we see the beehives, that's the scales. So usually the bees are collecting pollen as food reserve. That's common sense. Um, in good times, the bees can collect more pollen than they eat their own, on their own. That's why they put this or save this in honey. And so good times are usually spring and early summer. And it depends also a lot on the vegetation and the weather, how much pollen the bees are able to collect. So sometimes it's about comparing sites, say on this orchard or this meadow, uh, the bees get more pollen. And so that's better to have the hives there than on the other side. I mean, on the other side. So sometimes it's therefore interesting to move these beehives onto the good sides and that helps you to optimize the amount of honey you get. So the other thing is there are also bad times and in bad times the bees eat more than they collect. Usually that's at the end of the blossom period or in cold weather periods. And especially at the end of the blossom period it helps to optimize the honey quality quantity if you know the time point when more is eaten than they uh, bring in. So there, there's a point when the bees eat more than they bring in. So and if you had that point, then it's pretty good or it's better. Uh, so a bee master told me that it's about uh, half a kilo per day and per hive, which he is, lo which he, he is losing in honey if he doesn't exchange the honey with sugar water. So usually what you do, if the blossom period is over, you, re you take the honey and replace it with sugar water. And if you know the exact time point, then you can save a lot of honey. You get more honey out of it. And therefore, also a mobile beehive scale helps you to keep more honey from the bees. OK, to be frank, um, beehive scales are no new idea. At least it's not my idea. <laughs> and they are out since a couple of years. Um, even open source and maker variants are out for a couple of years. Uh, these are just one site. Uh, there are also a lot of other sites. So BeeLogger DE and Hi HiveEyes.org, they're the ones I like most, but yeah, as I said, there are also others. And there are also quite a lot of commercial offerings available. So if you want really to buy one, you can also do this. Um, yes, and this mobile beehive scale presented here, I have to confess it's neither the cheapest, there are cheaper ones, and it's not the most precise one. There are much more expensive ones, which are much more precise. It's something in between. But what it offers is a really excellent cellular connectivity. Uh, so this works well from free AA battery cells, and it's able to send every hour a message for a year. Mm, for, for the bee masters, it's sometimes not obvious, but <laughs> but for the technicians, it's obvious. Um, of course, it works only if you have cellular network. It doesn't work in some valleys where you don't have coverage. That's that's the point. So, but um, yeah, I think people should know that not in every place in this earth you have cellular uh, coverage. Um, therefore, it doesn't really work everywhere. But if you have cellular network, then it works. Okay, so now about my development of this mobile beehive scale. I started with this last year, early last year. Uh, so the first approach was with simple load cells for bathroom scales. It's really for usually for bathrooms, but they are very cheap. You see them here. This is our, so, so it looks like a, a metal plate and you can put a little pressure on it and that gets an electrical signal. Um, we run this scale, it's really this scale you see here now uh, for about a year. And so, and the feedback from the B master was that the communication works reliable, but the measurements of that simple scale, that depends too much on the temperature 
especially if the sun shines. So one problem is if the sun shines and only one of those sensors get heated and the others not, then you have no chance. Uh, and this really makes the the weight varying for one kilo or more. So that's not, yeah, it has some usage, but it's not what we really want. So therefore we started last September also a redesign of this solution. So, and so this is now the mobile beehive scale version two. Uh, I made here an overview of the building block. So in the sandbox, we now have the modem itself and the microcontroller. Um, in our case, this is co-located in the same uh, yeah, uh, SOC system on, on chip. And then we have mainly batteries. The sandbox is not more any longer. It's just batteries, modem, and microcontroller. On the scale, we now have the ADC, is the converter from the signals into to digital digital information. We need a calibration storage because any scale is slightly different and needs to be calibrated. And obvious to 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 measure the weight, we need a strain gauge. So here. That's a sandbox and that's one of the scale, that's the ground board of the scale with here with the ADC board. So mobile beehive scale version two, some reasons behind we, we moved or I moved the ADC converts analog values into digital values from the sandbox to the scale that's basically done because shorter analog wires are less temperature affected if you have long wires, you will really measure that. You need short wires and they should be not in the sun. So therefore we moved it inside. Uh, we moved also our calibration storage out of the sandbox into the scale. That's a special apron there. That's for easier exchanging scales. So if you move and you put the scales from the boxes and then you're on the new field and you put it in, it's pretty hard to remember which scale should be on which plug. And with this system, it, it's not longer necessary. You can exchange them. That makes it also easier to calibrate scales on other sandboxes. So you can have one sandbox at home for calibration and that works pretty fine. And you don't need to care which, which scale is on which box and on which plug it works now. And we use these parallel beam load cells. These are much better cells. They are come with temperature compensation and they reduce the dependency on the temperature a lot. Uh, so as I said, we started the development last September and we did then a test run for six months, mainly in my office and my garden. That was pretty nice, pretty well done. And now for one month, you're under the beehive. So now we have our sort of real data. Currently, I run two sandboxes and four scales, and there are more to come. End of this week, I will have one sandbox and two scales more in the field. So here's some pictures. So that's the picture I showed initially. So here's the scale. That's the beehive. And the sandbox is somewhere in between. That's a second scale. So I usually prepare the sandbox to be able to run two scales. So there we have this scale, this scale, and that's a sandbox. That's a picture of the sandbox. Here we see the batteries, and here we see uh, slightly the feather. And then we have only a, a test button and an LED to show if it works. That's the scale. So here we see this parallel beam load cell. I think it's really quite different. It's a more complex, complex device than this bathroom load cells. It has also another price. So usually four bathroom cells are about five euro. And here one of those cells is about 20 euro and you need two of them. So it's also version two is also quite more expensive than the version one. Yeah, and here we see our ADC board. It's using a ready uh, ADC board yeah, with a special scale chip on it. And we just uh, added an, a small EPROM to this board and it's all connected via E2C bus then with the sandbox. So now that's what why we do all, so that's the chart, what we want, and that's the real life chart of the last April. So we see here, April 24. And 
and so in, in in the first thing it was a test in my garden so no bees on it and you see that the green lines are pretty straightforward and they have only small ripples the ripples are from temperature so it's not completely compensated but it's pretty good then when we put the the scales under the hives we see the large ripples and we see the weight is going up that was then the phase where the bees are flying and they collect pollen and so that's what we want so that's a that was the good uh, good phase there in here early uh, early april late march here in south germany i'm located in south germany and then the weather was going bad so here we see bad weather and then again we see that the ripples are much smaller which means that the bees stay in hive so the explanation if if the bees go out to fly then also the bees have a weight and you see this weight in these ripples here and so if these ripples are small then only a few bees go out of the hive to to fly so that's also a good sign um together with the temperature we see here that's a good sign in which phase we are with the honey and with the beehive uh, here we see then also that the weather was going better again and the bees are flying we see that they have larger ripples here but we also see that the weight is declining and not increasing so here the bees are flying but they don't find pollen something we also good for the bee master to know so now we can compare here two sites so these are two different sites so the bee master is using uh, two different meadows for his beehives and on the one meadow we see they fly but they don't collect honey and on the other we see they fly and they collect honey and so it's now a sign for the bee master to put some hives from this uh, meadow into that meadow and if he does that then he gets more honey that's the idea behind this mobile beehives cave okay so we're finished with the Bohi mobile beehives cave so another pretty interesting idea was the battery vampire so the reason behind this is that some classic German spot cars tends to have a pretty high battery discharge when they are not operated so um, yeah a lot of friends which love their sports car don't drive them in winter and that makes them frequently get afraid if the battery is discharged in spring when they want to drive it so the battery vampire therefore just measures this car battery voltage in presents this as charge then you know where you are uh, the users can then see when it's time to recharge the battery or drive the car um, some users even have something as a permanent per preservation charging so that's a charge uh, charge device which always charges the the battery over a long time and you can monitor that and yeah and in that case is in that case it's mainly showing that not someone unplugs this charging this discharger so currently only two cars are monitored and currently only for a couple of months so here is the chart for the battery vampire so we see here first a car garage with a power supply so that we can charge the battery permanently so which charges stops church charges stops and so on so here we see that the voltage is hold it and from this point on the car was moved into another garage and then we see that the voltage is dropping and dropping and now you see when you need to drive or to do something and if you wait too long you at least know that the car will not start the engine without trouble so it was pretty easy thing so it was done in two afternoons just uh, adding a resistor network to the 12 voltage to divide them and then use the adc of the modem in order to get the battery voltage pretty fast done and because it uses the software stack I'm presenting here it was fast done but it works reliable because you already see here it's 128 days so it's not that bad and it was running all the time
that's pretty cool. So here you see the, the battery of the modem itself. It was also going down, but uh, that's usually if you operate a device for more than 100 days. So good result from my side. So the last, the very cheap one, <laughs> This was the wine refrigerator, Shepherd. So some people put their wine into a cooler. Um, okay, it's not my cooler, it's a cooler of a friend. Um, and you can just put the thinky in this and then the thinky will just measure the temperature and send this. And so the, the, good, uh, the good thing of this idea is you don't need to do anything. You just buy a thinky, that's the orange box. <laughs> and then you have everything working out of the box. Um, what, what, what you can see here is that the refriger uh, refrigerator works pretty well. So here you see the line is always pretty good. But what you also see is that here on the battery voltage level, we have some steps. Here is a step, here is a step, and here is the huge step. And these steps are usually caused by network searches. So the point is if you put this device in the basement of your house, the signal level is pretty low and with that it tends to spend a lot of time a lot of energy into network searches you need to put this into consideration if you want to know how long this device runs i guess everybody can see if we have only these lines and not the steps i guess it will run at least twice so currently this device is running about 200 days so 265 the whole chart, but from here to here, it's about 200 days. Um, and if we don't have the steps, I guess this will be 300 days. So we, we, we nearly have it. So that's my sum up of cellular IoT experience in the wild, experience in the wild. So in, in my experience running a cellular device from battery over longer time works maybe not the 10 years we read some well but for a couple of years one and two years or a couple of months it really worked um, the use case considered here is metering and monitoring so this means smaller messages couple of hundred bytes 500 bytes 600 bytes they are exchanged low frequently maybe every couple of hours, maybe every hour or something like that, but not every five minutes. That's not the case, but also not every day only. It's really one or two hours or something like that. That's a good use case for this. So the energy consumption may be split into three domains. The one is the sending, the other one is the square scan current, and the next one is the network searches. And so in my experience, the point is, uh, if you send messages with a couple of hundred bytes, the protocol and the interval is the most relevant thing. So it means if you send it every hour, every two hour, every 30 minutes, that makes the difference. But if you send 400 bytes or 500 bytes or 600 bytes, that doesn't make the difference. It will make a difference if it then starts to reach some kilobytes, say, there will be a difference if you have 500 bytes compared to 50 kilobytes or something like that. But in smart metering and monitoring, I think a couple of hundred bytes will do the job. Um, then the other thing is that the choir scan current, this mainly depends on the hardware design and on the battery self-discharge. And we need to consider that. Uh, using an efficient protocol as this one here, my experience is that one message exchange takes similar energy than one or two hours of two, one or two hours of quiet phase. So we we need therefore to be careful because sometimes it's said, okay, I exchanged a message every hour, and if I now exchange the message only once a day, then the device will run ten times longer. That's not true. If you calculate it, if you get points, so we have then uh, two points for the messages in two hours and one point, one energy point for the quiet phase in two hours. If you now uh, remove all the points for sending and put them into the quiet phase, you see that it will only last three times. So you, you, 
even if you really don't send a message every hour instead of that every day, you don't get a too longer runtime because it only amplifies or only yeah it only multiplies this time by three and not by ten so that's that's a mistake people usually make so say one hour to 24 then i have 10 times longer that's not true it's depends a lot on what you have but usually you don't get it that much okay so and the last thing in my experience is that the network searches are really hard to predict so that's the, the hard part and you and especially if you work on low radio signals or if your device is moving and is moving across cells. So usually a cell has about 10 kilometers or something like that. If you just move within the cell, this is not an issue. But if you move across cells, then you need, in a lot of cases, some network searches. And such network searches really take energy and therefore you need you need to to calculate a buffer for that so i'm done with it so do do we have um any questions oh i think two um, i think so we do we have two wonderful questions so how good is the battery life of your field devices a few months more and how could you improve battery life further mm. I, that yeah so in my experience yeah that, that 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 this this question has a lot of you so the one view is um we need energy for for sending messages and we need energy for the choir scan and the battery has a self-discharge so if we address the self-discharge, then we will find out that the lithium blah, blah, blah Aku has a larger self-discharge than if we use an, uh, another technique, it's nickel metal hydride. Sorry for German words. <laughs> um, so, but if you, you search for this, it's called LDS Aku, low self, no LSD Akus, low self-discharging Akus. And if you use them, you get a longer runtime. The other point is really the protocol. Therefore, uh, you hear you hear a lot. Uh, as I said, any protocol claims it's reliable, it's secure, and it's efficient. I don't believe this. And um, always when I ask, okay, can we have then a demo for that? Nobody show, uh, shows up. Um, so the, the point is um, co-op DTLS connection ID is really one of the most efficient ones. And if you can run a Finky, so this, this orange box with this battery, uh, exchanging data every hour for a year from battery with another protocol and with encryption, okay, uh, then that's cool, but I don't think so. So you need to, to take the protocol, which is really efficient, not just claims it. Uh, you need to take a battery, which fits your requirements. And if you do that, then it works. So I think it's, it, uh, it's in the end, it's possible to, to run about two years from cells, from batteries, okay? Okay, perfect. And then we have the next question is, what did you learn about bee behavior with the data you collected? Mm, I guess, so I'm no bee master. So there was a bee master uh, who, who told this to me. Um, so I don't think that he has learned too much because he has known the most things ahead. So the idea of this beehive scale is, as I said, not a new one. So they are now uh, available, I, I think, for at least a decade. So you, you don't learn too much about the behavior because you know it before. But you now have this information in real time. So now you have the information that the beehives on the one meadow collect more pollen than on the other meadow and and this was clear before that something like that happened but now you know on which meadow they have more honey so and you know it when you when you sit at home and when you use your mobile phone to check which beehive scales currently perform better and so that was all known before but now you have the 
the real-time data and now you can plan your act. This means now you know, okay, I drive to the meadow one, pick up some beehives and bring them to the other one in order to have more honey. Or you know, okay, uh, now it's time to exchange honey with sugar water. Um, but it's not something new, it's more it was known and now you have the data in order to act proper. Hope this answers. All right, perfect. Well, I wanted to start off by saying thank you uh, for the excellent presentation You're today, Akeem. <laughs> and <You're back>. um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And we're always looking uh, to book some more Edge of Thing webinars. So if there's anybody in the audience that is interested in presenting, I'm going to provide a link in the chat um, to help. Uh, uh, it's just a form that you complete and you fill out and then we get notified and we'll set something up. So we're hoping to get a few more of these talks in by the end of the year. And lastly, I have very exciting news, everyone. So Open Community Experience is um, the Eclipse Foundation flagship uh, event. Um, it's the developer conference that we host, formerly known as EclipseCon. Um, so uh, it's it's uh, something that's going to be kicking off on October 22nd to October 24th in Mainz, Germany. And the call for papers is also open. So I will share the link for that also in the chat. So if you're interested um, to propose a talk there as well, uh, you are more than welcome to do so. And registrations will be open very, very soon. So that wraps up today's webinar. Thank you so much, Akeem, and we will see you all very, very soon. Take care, everyone.